In this video, we will discuss common serve receive patterns and what we should be looking for as the R2. Some of the areas of responsibility as the R2 are before play. As the R2, you should be watching the receiving team. You should be looking for possible alignment faults. This is what we are going to focus on in this video. The other responsibilities that the R2 has are during play. They are transitioning from side to side to get to the blocking side. They're watching for net and centerline violations and also helping out the R1 whenever possible. Today, we're going to focus on before play. So the second referee is responsible for seeing the receiving team and making sure they are in the correct order. Alignment faults occur between adjacent players, so side to side and front to back. Right side players must be closer to the right sideline than the center player in their corresponding row. Left side players must have at least one foot closer to the left sideline than the center player in their corresponding row. And then front row players must have at least one foot in contact with the floor closer to the center line than their corresponding back row player. So for serve receive, the R2 is looking at the serve receive the receiving team and trying to figure out, are they out of alignment? Is somebody overlapping? Now, for those of us who have never played competitively, never coached, you may not even understand why the players line up in certain serve receive positions. Well, there's a couple different reasons. First of all, you wanna have your best passers in the serve receive rotation. You want your best passer to pass that first ball over, that serve. You don't want your player that's going to shank every single ball. You don't want them taking that first ball. Secondly, you don't want your setter to take the first contact. They want the second contact. And then you want your setter to be in the best position for them to get to their setter position. You want them to be in the best position for them to set the ball to their hitters. So players are going to need to move around a little bit to achieve these goals. But because of the rules of volleyball, there are areas they cannot go. They cannot overlap the other players. A player cannot cross their adjacent player or players before the ball is contacted for serve. Now, for serve receive formations, there's a lot of main ones that we're gonna focus on. There's a lot of common ones that are adjusted slightly, but there's a pattern. You're gonna be able to see it once you start figuring it out. So let's start with our setters. Our setters want to be in what I'm going to call setter position. They want to strive to be as close as they can to this position. These little dots right here in blue. They on each side, so this red line is the net. These blue dots are where the setter wants to be. This is where they strive to be every single second contact of the ball. So. You are trying to pass the ball to the setter in this position or as close to this position as possible. So like I mentioned a couple minutes ago, the setter wants to be as close to this position as possible to begin with, without overlapping their players. They don't wanna take the first hit and you want your best passers to try and pass the ball to your setter. Okay, let's look over here. On the right side of the court, we've got players 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. Player 1, I have them in a different color. That is going to be our setter. Depending on if you're running a 6, 2, or a 5, 1, meaning that 
If you're running a 5-1, your setter sets all the way around and five people are your hitters. You have five hitters, one setter. A 6-2 is where the setter sets from the back row and usually her opposite, so setter is number one here, their opposite is number seven. That will be your other setter or other setter position. They may sub out, but they will set from the back row only. And when number one gets to the front row, they become a hitter and number seven will be in the back row and they will be the setter. So let's just talk a little bit about this rotation right here. Our setter is in the back row and they want to be as close to that setter position up to the net as they can without overlapping their adjacent players. So we're gonna move our setter up a little bit. Try and get them closer to that setter position. So number one is pulling up. Now remember, because of our adjacent rules here, number one, cannot be closer to the net, to that center line, than number three. So we're good here. Three is still slightly in front of number one. So that's still good. Now let's see what else happens. We're gonna move a couple players around so that we can cover that hole back there. So let's watch that one more time. We're just gonna have 11 and nine, our two, back, up two other back row players move over. And number seven, our front row player, move back. A couple of the adjacent overlaps that you might want to focus on. Number 11 cannot be closer to the right sideline than number one. So we are good right here. Number one is still slightly closer to that right sideline. So number 11 is fine. We're good with number nine. We didn't move around enough. Number seven, remember, number seven is front row and number nine is right behind number seven. They are adjacent players. <clears throat> so number seven has to be slightly in front of number nine, which they are. So we are good right here. This is a very, very, very common pattern that you will see. This is a serve receive pattern that happens quite often. Now let's say number seven is passing terribly, or that's actually not our best passer. We can always keep number seven up at the net and we can move number three and number one back. But remember, number one is going to have to stay behind number three. So, she's gonna have a little further to run to get to setter position. And remember, they cannot move until the ball is contacted for serve. So depending on who your best um, passers are, where your setter is, and how you want your serve receive pattern to look, the coach and the team are going to line up in a way that helps them. So as the R2, you are looking for these overlaps. All right, now let's go ahead and have them rotate. Number one, our setter is in the middle now. Their opposite is still number seven. It's always gonna be number seven and their opposite is right across. All right, again, just like we did before, Number one, our setter wants to be as close to setter position as possible. So we are gonna have them pull up. All right, so we're pushing up number seven. So what are we looking for here? Number one needs to be slightly behind number seven. Number seven has to be closer to that center line than number one. Now we've got this big hole in the middle. So there's a couple different ways to fill in that hole. And one of the most common ways is to just bring back one of your players. So number nine is our left front player. We have to make sure that they are a tiny bit closer to that center line than the left back player, which is number 11. So we're good there. 
Now, one thing that you have to be very careful with in this position, number one needs to stay in between number three and number 11 here. Remember, number one is middle back, and these are the adjacent players. A lot of times, they will inch one way or another because somebody's not passing very well or they're not paying attention, and there will be an overlap right here. It will be because of these three players. One thing to look for in this specific rotation where your setters are the middle position is do you have two players on each side of the setters? So we have number five in the front, number three in the back. They are both on the right side of the setter. And then you have number 11 in the back and number nine, who's the front row player to the left of the setter. So if they have two players, one front, one back, two players, one front, one back, and you've got the middle two, you're usually gonna be good. That's a very easy trick to look for. All right, let's rotate again. <clears throat> Our setter now is in the left back position, number one, opposite, still number seven, over here in the front row. <clears throat> There's a couple different ways that we can do this. The main way, just like we did when we were on the other side, we're gonna have number one, our setter, pull up. They are pushing number 11 up. They are not closer to that net, that center line than number 11, so we're good. But now we have that hole. So we can do what we did before and just move number seven back, move number three and number five over a little bit. As long as number three is not closer to the left sideline than the setter, we're good. And number seven has to be closer to the net, the center line, than number five. Everyone looks good here. That was an easy one. But let's now try this other one that I see a lot and it is very common because it brings the setter even closer to setter position. And like I said before, number seven is not our best passer. So we don't want number seven in that rotation. Instead, number nine is a really good passer. I'm gonna bring number nine out. Now, this looks very strange. You're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Look at that one more time. All right. One, their adjacent players are number 11 and number three. Okay, so one cannot cross in front of 11. Okay, we're good. Cannot be to the right of number three. Okay, three's still good. We're good. Okay, now let's see what's going on. Number nine is moving back. All right. Number nine and number three are adjacent players. Nine has to be in front of three. Looks good. Nine and 11 were adjacent players. Nine is in the middle. All right, 11 is closer to that left sideline. We are good. Hmm, that looks pretty good right there. Everyone is in the proper alignment. We've got number nine, our best passer passing. We've got our setter as close to setter position as she can get. Everything looks good. That is a very common one and it's very tricky. It looks like it's wrong, but you'll get used to seeing it. Once you really start recognizing these patterns, this will become easier. All right, let's rotate again. And now, our setter is in the front row. So number one, the setter is in the front row. If we were playing the 5-1 rotation, they would still be the setter and they would still want to get as close to setter position as possible. But you already have people back in the back that can pass. If number seven is still doing terribly, you can pull them out of the rotation, pull number nine back. Let number nine pass. As long as nine is closer to the center line than number seven, you're good. Number one, number 11, and number nine, they can all push towards the right sideline 
as long as they stay in this order, they are good. You can bring number one all the way up to the setter position as long as number 11 moves as well. Front row is a lot easier to see um, where the setter is going. They don't have to move as many people around to get to the spot that they want to be in. So a lot of times they don't have to move and you don't have a lot of overlaps or possible overlaps. There still can be some, but you don't worry about it as much. Now, if we are running a 6-2, that means that this, when this setter, number one, gets to the front row, they are now going to be a hitter, and number seven is going to turn into our setter. So number seven here is now our setter, and we can do the same exact thing that we did with number one at that very first position we talked about. Number seven can pull number nine up, push them all the way to the net. As long as number seven doesn't go in front of number nine, closer to that center line, we're good. And then the next two rotations will be the same that we already talked about. So they're the same patterns that you're looking for. You really only have to memorize three of them, or if they're doing a five one, you can memorize six of them, but again, the ones in the front row and the setters in the front row, they don't move around very much. There's not that much to look at. So these three common serve-receive rotations and positionings and patterns, those are key. They can be adjusted slightly, but they most of the time look something like this. Every now and then you'll get a very creative rotation that isn't anything like this, but nobody's overlapping. But I would say 90% of the time, you are going to see something very close to these variations. When you are the R2 and you are looking for this overlap, you are looking for the out of alignment, the illegal alignment, it's going to be before they contact the ball for serve. So you're not looking at the server, as the R2, you are going to be standing on the receiving C team's side, watching the receiving team. You're going to be looking for these overlaps. You're going to be finding your setter, looking and making sure that they're opposite. Number one and number seven are still opposites. Making sure that there's no weird overlap going on. If you do see an overlap, as soon as the ball is contacted for serve, you blow your whistle to call the illegal alignment. So as soon as that ball is contacted and you say, oh, that setter is not in the right place, they are way overlapping, they need to move around, that is not right, you immediately blow your whistle, step out, show the signal for illegal alignment, the R1 agrees, and the R2 then mimics the point. Let's watch that one more time. Whistle, illegal alignment, R1 says, yep, I agree, and we both give the point. At that point, you're probably going to have to explain what the illegal alignment was, what did you see out of rotation, who was overlapping, and you'll have to say, number two, you need to stay behind number seven. Um, number or what we were talking about earlier with the numbers earlier. Number one, you're leaving too early. You are crossing number five before the ball is contacted for serve. As soon as that ball is contacted for serve, they can move wherever they want on the court. But before the contact, they have to be in their proper spots, not overlapping anyone. As you can see, they can move around a lot of different places, but they cannot overlap those adjacent players. So some key points to remember, don't watch your server. You wanna be focusing on the receiving team. So before the point, sorry, before the serve, the contact of serve, you are going to be checking the receiving team to make sure that no one is overlapping. As soon as that ball is contacted for serve, they can move and you will be moving as well. Find your setter, find their opposite.
that will help you figure out where people should be. It is hard to know where six people are supposed to be at all times on both sides of the court. You know, you have to focus on the receiving team. Well, as soon as they get the ball back, you're focused on the other six people. And it's very difficult to just memorize exactly where those six people and the other six people are supposed to be every single time. Help yourself out. Know your setter and your opposite. That will help you pinpoint where people are supposed to be. If they are not always opposite, you know something's weird. Then try to remember these common patterns, these serve-receive patterns, these very simple patterns right here. Remember them. Again, they can be slightly different each time, but for the most part, you're going to see something very similar to these. So try and focus on where these patterns are putting people. And I promise you, this will get easier with time. If you haven't played and you don't know what you're doing, if you haven't coached before, it's going to be very difficult at first. But you'll start seeing these patterns. You'll start recognizing, why is my setter already there? There's nobody in front of them, and I know their back row. What is going on? You'll start to see it. It will get easier. So hopefully these couple patterns and serve-receive tips will help you out when you play and when you are the R2.